All right, so we're going to continue security evaluation today. We're going to talk about stocks. We'll talk about the inputs, which uh, one is the growth rate. We'll spend a little bit of time on the growth rate. The second input is the discount rate. We've already done that, but I'll refresh on that. And then we'll look at a few models that you use for valuing stocks. So the biggest input, the most important input is your growth rate. How fast will the dividends of this firm or the earnings of this firm grow? So we've covered part of this historically already looking at the U.S. economy. How fast can the U.S. economy grow? Remember we talked about productivity growth, labor growth, inflation. You might be able to get somewhere between 4 to 6 percent would be reasonable. Six is probably a little bit high. Uh, labor growth is one percent has been the historical number but uh, we have a lot of baby boomers retiring and population growth itself has slowed down. So one is a pretty high number there. The Federal Reserve seems to be targeting two percent on inflation. So it really does come down to productivity. Productivity growth has been really weak We've had a tough time getting back above 1% on productivity growth. So 2 is a little bit of a stretch. So that's why I think, you know, I say 4 to 6%. It might even be 3 to 6%, although 3 would be a really, really weak number. Um, but our economy seems to be at a permanently much lower growth rate than we've seen historically, partly for good reason, because inflation is much lower. But the weakness in productivity has been somewhat of an issue. Um, but that's the overall. So you got the overall U.S. economy. So it's going to grow. Let's say four. Let's just keep it at four to six percent. That's going to be important because when you do a growth rate for your company, you're going to have a couple of growth rates that have to think about. One is a short-term growth rate, maybe over the next five to ten years. But all firms will have what we call a terminal growth rate. That growth rate you'll get uh, once they become just a normal company because no no company can grow a lot faster than the economy for a very very long time you know if alphabet or amazon or apple if they were to grow at 15 20 percent for decades they would essentially become the entire u.s economy it's just that high 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 growth over many many years it just becomes so exponential that you know if alphabet kept growing at 15 20 percent every year and they did that for 70 years, then in 70 years they would be the world economy. So at some point a firm just cannot grow that much faster. We saw a really fast growth rate from Walmart, but at this point all Walmart can do is add more stores, and they've already done that. They've already saturated the U.S. So in the U.S., they, there's just not that many more places for them to put stores. So the most they can grow in the U.S. is just whatever their price increases are, which is just probably just inflation. They can grow overseas, but eventually they get saturated overseas. The a firm like um, Netflix, eventually, at the most, you've got the entire world population using your service. And at that point, you can only grow with population growth. Same thing with Apple. Once everybody has your phone or you've saturated the market, at some point, you know, you got to keep creating new products, but at some point, it's just... There's, it's just difficult for a firm to grow much faster than the economy. So we're that 4 to 6% is very, very important because you'll all be using that number somewhere in your analysis uh, of your company. However, firms can look very different the next 5 to 10, 15 years, depending on what industry they are in and depending on the company itself. So the second thing you want to look at is what is this industry? How is it doing? This is an industry that's early in its product life cycle. What are the demographics? Who are the customers for this? Is that a demographic that's growing? You know, we think about baby boomers. We have a lot of senior citizens around the world. Does their product focus in on senior citizens? Or is it more for young people? And, and demographics is actually one of the, the best pieces of data we have that's predictable. We, have a, we know how many people there are of uh, all over the world, different ages, and we know what death rates are, what birth rates are, so we have a pretty good idea of demographics, so that can be a pretty good indication. Um, you know, are firms going global? Is this an industry that's expanding overseas? 
And so a, a good one, hopefully you had this in one of your classes. If not, I, make sure you cover this. But Porter's Five Forces is extremely important to understand the industries and where they are. You probably have had it, or at least hinted at it. The five forces are buyer power, supplier power, barriers to entry, threats of substitutes, and rivalry within the industry. Um, and Porter also talks about key strategies within the industry, cost leader, differentiation, and focus. Um, we don't have time to get into that theory, but if you know that theory and want to bring it into your, your discussion for your company, you could certainly could do that. Um, there's also this concept of economic moats, which I, I think economic moats is becoming a more common term to bring up um, in finance. So if, if you want to try to impress someone in an interview, you know, Porter's Five Horses is good to bring up, but economic moats maybe even more so. And, and that has to do, this is more at the company level, but it could be the industry level, but it's sustainable competitive advantages. So you have a firm that is... Um, growing really fast or industry growing really really fast it might be that there's some protection of that company or industry that keeps competitors from coming in so it could be like a, um, an apple that has name recognition has a brand name and people buy apple phones just because they think they're higher quality or a tesla has a reputation for being a high quality car and being the leader in, in electronic vehicles or even just Coca-Cola and Kellogg's companies that because of their brand name people buy the product just because they recognize it. McDonald's, uh, those type of brands. Um, there's also the platform type of economic moat. Uh, uh, Facebook, you know, Facebook is huge. It has a few billion users and people say I want to do social media where Facebook's the obvious place to go because that's where you're most likely to find more of your friends from high school or, or whatever from work and school and advertisers rather go to Facebook because that's where all the that's where all the users are the people they want to advertise to so they have a huge network or platform effect it gives them a huge advantage um, and, and because of that uh, they'll get more customers they'll keep their customers and I think Facebook has been facing a, a little bit of headwinds here recently because of all the political issues and, and issues about privacy and the sharing of data and those type of things. Uh, but they still have a huge advantage. It's, it's the obvious place to go if someone wants to try to reconnect just because they know there's a lot of people there and to start a whole new social media platform, we've, we've seen some try, you know, there's, there's Twitter, there's um, a few other places that are you know, just known to be the place to go gives them advantage, and you've seen some some competitors trying to come in to try to get into that market. It's just so 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 difficult. So those are huge advantages, and because of that, they have protection from competition. That means they can grow faster for a longer period of time. So, Porter's Five Forces, Economic Moats is a good good way to think about your firm. Porter's Five Forces is not that complex. So if you did a quick Wikipedia search you might be if you haven't had Porter's Five Forces, but you want to bring it in You could certainly bring it in using uh, Wikipedia Something else uh, Mike, uh, Michael Porter is the one who came up with Porter's Five Forces. He also has something he calls a value chain value chain management uh, So whatever company you're doing for your papers three and four I Really really do think uh, you probably could Google your company name in Porter's Five Forces, or your company's name in Economic Modes, or your company's name in Value Chain Management, and you would see reports come up that really help you understand the potential growth, the growth potential for your company. Um, and, and so, yeah, so B is the industry, C is your company, but there's a lot of overlap between those two. So, you know, is this a fast growing industry? And then your company, is your company gaining mar market share? Is it growing faster than the others? So again, the economic mode is really, really important. The brand identity, the platform, the patents, uh, the economies of scale can be an economic mode, you know, for utilities, if you're just a you're a protected monopoly, that gives you protection. Although usually with monopolies, they have protection from competition, but they, they sacrifice 
be able to price their products the way they want to. They have to, their, their rates are very regulated. So think a lot about your firm. Coming up with this growth rate is extremely important and the valuation of your company. When we look at valuing stocks, extremely sensitive to the growth rates you pick. Whether you pick a 5% or 6% growth rate is going to have a huge impact on what value you think that stock is. Now, I'll give you three approaches that you can use to at least get some sense of what the short-term growth rate for your firm would be. So again, right, think about growth, short-term growth, and terminal growth. The terminal growth is, is easy. It's that 4 to 6 percent economic growth. So eventually every firm will get to that 4 to 6 percent um, sometime in the future. So right now we're talking about the short-term growth, the near-term growth. So the first thing you can do is just look at the historical growth. So look uh, and I'll actually show you here we got um, we can just look at the rolling three five and ten year earnings per share growth um, but I'll show you some some other we don't have access to Bloomberg unfortunately and that's how you would do this in Bloomberg I'll see if maybe I can get you the data I don't know but um, but you, you can certainly look uh, at least the somewhat recently and you can pull up their annual report and just look at their earnings per share and just see how much it's been growing the last few years. So, you know, if you think this company is going to, going to grow 20%, but they haven't grown 20% ever in their history or they've only grown 3 or 4% the last several years, then you, you got a pretty wild growth rate assumption. So I'm not saying that you just extrapolate the past into the future, although that is really what a lot of stock analysts do. But if a firm hasn't been growing very fast, to suddenly assume they will grow fast, you have to have some catalyst for that. What's the reason for that? Um, so we tend to, most analysts do, tend to keep their growth forecast pretty consistent with recent growth. So, you know, at least you'd be in the ballpark with a lot of other analysts. The second approach is essentially saying, hey, what does the market think the growth rate is going to be? And so there is a number out there that you can, you can use. We're going to uh, talk about relative value analysis here a little bit later, PE ratios and those type of things, but there is one ratio called the PEG ratio. And the PEG ratio is the firm's PE ratio, forward PE ratio, divided by what the market thinks their earnings will grow the next five years. So if you get the firm's PEG ratio and their PE ratio, then the expected growth for the company over the next five years is just their P.E. ratio divided by their PEG ratios. So let's let's try that with a couple of companies here. All right, so here's Apple stock. I'm going to go to statistics. When you go to statistics, that will give you the PEG ratio and the forward P.E. ratio. So their forward P.E., you can see it right here. Forward P.E. is 28.49. And their peg ratio is right there, 2.71. And so if you if you take those two numbers, so you take 28.49 divided by 2.71, you get a growth rate of 10.5. You get 10.5, you just have to put a percent sign on the end of it, 10.5%. So that's what they're assuming. So if for Apple, then you take the PE of 28.49 divided by the PEG of 2.71, and you say, okay, the stock market thinks Apple's earnings over the next five years will grow about 10 and a half percent. That gives you it gives you a number. Now you're using the market to do that. You have to you need to come up with your own number, but at least gives you something that if your assumption is 32 percent or 3 percent, you know you're way off of what the market thinks. It might give you some pause for concern. And then the last approach, this is the approach I was taught, and theoretically it makes a lot of sense. It's called a sustainable growth model. And here what it says is your growth the next few years should equal the firm's return on equity times its retention. Now what is retention? You know what return on equity is. You can look that up. When a firm pays a dividend, they're... they're they're paying some of the earnings and they're retaining some of the earnings. 
So if their earnings per share is four seventy four and they pay a dividend of a dollar fifty nine, then they're retaining three dollars and fifteen cents. Of their four dollars and seventy four cents in earnings, they're paying out a dollar fifty nine, so they're retaining at three fifteen. So their retention rate is three fifteen divided by four seventy four, or they're retaining sixty six percent of their earnings. They're paying out thirty four percent of their earnings. Uh, why are they retaining it? Well, it's probably to increase their capacity, more capex, to, to invest in the firm so they can grow faster. So the argument is a firm really can't grow their, their earnings if they pay out all of their earnings. They need to retain some of their earnings so they can reinvest it in the firm and have some growth. So this implies more retention should mean higher growth, higher earnings growth. Um, now there's some capex that's just maintenance. Some firms have to retain earnings just to maintain where they are. They gotta fix their stores. So it's hard it's hard to say how much of retention is actually adding to growth. But the thought is you cannot grow much, probably not much more than inflation, if you don't retain some. And so the theory is, and there's you can actually mathematically show this is true, and it is true if your ROE stays exactly the same. It is true that this will be your growth rate your return on equity times retention and so if a firm's ROE is somewhat stable then yeah this should be their growth rate their return on equity times their retention makes it really simple to calculate if your retention is 66 percent and return on equity is 10 percent then your growth rate assumption would be 10 percent times 0.66 or 6.6 percent so how do we do this with with Apple so with Apple, we need we need to return on equity, and so you find return on equity right here. Now the return on equity is ridiculously high, so we're going to get a probably a pretty ridiculous number, 8209. And then you want to look at the retention, where the retention is one minus their payout ratio. So their payout ratio is 21.77 or 22%. So their retention is going to be 78%. So their ROE is 70 something percent, the retention 78%. When you multiply that together, you get a ridiculously huge number. No, no question. So 0 0.8209. times 0.78 and you get 64%. Well, 64% is a crazy, crazy number. Um, so what is the problem there? We have an unusually high return on equity because of COVID and everything going on. Um, so what you may need to do on something like this, you know, Apple's obviously having a good year is not look at the current return on equity, but maybe look at the average the last several years or something along those lines. I'm going to try to help you on papers three and four to find companies that this is going to work for. Um, I might actually even assign companies, and, you know, give you the option to pick a different company, but assign companies so we, we find companies that will actually work well for you because, you know, COVID-19 is, is going to make it challenging because 2020 was such an unusual year. So firms either have incredibly bad numbers or incredibly good numbers you know we could we could definitely look at um, a firm like United Airlines and you just assume that their numbers are all going to be negative there's negative 83 80% so you obviously can't use that so COVID-19 is going to make things challenging so I'll try to find some firms that are, you know, not not too crazy. Uh, we could try, maybe try Walmart. Walmart had a great year, but probably not as extreme as, as Apple. So 16% return on equity, 16.21% return on equity. And then what is their retention? Well, their payout is 40, 45, 46. So let, let's say it's 54%. So when you do when you do that math, 0.1621 times 
you get 8.7%. That seems like a reasonable number to assume for a Walmart. They're, they're still doing well coming out of COVID and probably have some pretty decent growth the next few quarters. Um, but that's what we're looking at uh, using this approach. So let's, let's say we get 8.7% with Walmart on that approach. And then we look at the Ford PE, and that's 25.58, and their PEG is 4.36. You compare those two numbers, so you take uh, 25.58 divided by 4.36, and you get 5.9%. So, you know, what's the right answer, 8.7 or 5.9? Well, on the paper, paper 4, you'll do all these methods, but eventually you've got to come up with a, uh, come up with a number that you believe, and you can ignore all of those and come up with your own number. But you have to find some number that expresses what you think the growth for this company is gonna be. It is not easy and it's extremely subjective and it's extremely material to the valuation. So that's that's the sustainable growth formula. Um, the challenge with this formula is it implies firms that retain more grow faster, firms that retain less grow more slowly. When you actually graph this over time, if you actually do a regression be between earnings growth and retention, you'll discover that the regression is actually negative. But I don't think it's negative because this theory is wrong. I think it's negative because of why firms suddenly change their retention. Um, during years like 2008 or during COVID, you've seen firms cut back on their, re their payouts, so the retention soars during those years. But the retention is not soaring because they're reinvesting in the firm to create growth. The retention is soaring because there's a crisis and they're scared to death to pay dividends. And so there's actually a relationship between you know cutting back on their dividends, retaining more, and lower growth because of just the crisis that's going on. So there's a lot of noise in the numbers. So if you look at it statistically over time, it looks like a really bad theory. I think the theory is correct. The firms that retain more over time tend to grow faster because they're reinvesting more in the firm. But the data is not real good from an empirical standpoint. It's not really, really strong on that. So our question is, what's, what is that near-term growth? What is the long-term growth? And then how long does it take to get from the near-term growth to the long-term growth? You'll see there's one model we're going to use called the H model, which you need all of this information as inputs. So right now, you know, Alphabet, Amazon, they're growing pretty fast. How much longer can they grow? And I like what Dr. Dammer Darren says, 10 years is a long time for a very, very high growth. So most firms that are, the firms we're seeing today, we say, well, there's so many firms and they're doing well, but we're seeing a small fraction of the firms that actually started. Most firms that started went out of business. So the hundreds of firms that are household names that we know, those, those are actually the minority. Most firms fail. And those firms that we see, they're, they're the one in a thousand that actually succeeded. And yeah, they had high growth. But their high growth didn't last 20, 30, 40 years. Most of them had really super high growth for three or four years, and then they became more normal firms. If you look at a firm like Intel, well, Intel had incredibly high growth because they were the chip provider for desktop computers, and desktop computers were taking over the world. And so for a few years there, Intel was just growing incredibly fast. But that high growth period only lasted about a decade, and then they became a normal company. Amazon is, is going a little further with, with the hyper growth, but um, I'm going to encourage you that when you're talking about a high growth period, especially when you're up in the 20% growth, really, really high growth, uh, I would recommend you assume that doesn't last longer than 10 years. That's just, it's really hard to sustain something like that. You know, certainly Facebook is growing that fast, but you're starting to see the headwinds Facebook is facing. Google's starting to struggle with what else can we do? You know, we're making so much money on advertising, but we're, we're essentially there. We've we got that market. we got a corner on that market. How else can we generate more growth? And they're, they're doing a lot of stuff that's interesting, but it's will it really come to fruition that they can produce a product? You know, they're involved in autonomous vehicles. 
is that really going to work or not? You know, Apple, I, I was really shocked at the Apple Watch and how it's taken off the last few years. I really didn't think that project, that product would really work, but it seems like it did get a good growth spurt there. But their laptops and their iPad, iPads are slowing down. Their desktops are obviously slowing down. The iPhone is still growing, but it's getting to the point now where, where they've, they've essentially cornered most of the markets they can get. Uh, can the watch really help them? And if the watch grows and they get a good growth on the watches, what do they replace after the watch? What's the next thing? They've got the Apple card. Uh, they're looking at maybe, you know, firms are looking at Bitcoins and all kinds of stuff, you know. Even Apple's getting a little bit involved in autonomous vehicles. Apple's gotten very heavily involved in the uh, personal health, using the phone as a personal health monitor. And there's a lot of apps coming for that. So, you know, this whole healthcare industry, that's a multi-trillion dollar industry that is just just ripe for uh, disruption and innovation and Apple's involved in that and I'm glad they are because it's an industry that needs to be disrupted but you have to really just stop stop and think where can they go because Apple's already a trillion dollar company so they can't just add one new product that's growing really fast because they've got these products that are already billion dollar products a 10 million dollar product that's growing 20 percent is not going to make Apple grow fast until that product gets big enough so it's tough Sustaining really high growth for a long period of time is very difficult for all firms. And we don't think it's all that difficult because we think of the few that survived that did that. We just got to remember those were the incredible exceptions to the rule. And even those companies like Microsoft and Apple and Amazon, even theirs, they're going to have a period of time where they're going to be slowing down here in the next few years. It just cannot last forever. All right. And then your terminal growth rate, that's what we talked about. Use the economy, that 4 to 6%. So I'm giving you some good numbers that you can use. You've got to pick the number. That 4 to 6% is a pretty wide range, so you've got to pick what you believe. But once you pick that number, you put it in your model. All right, so the models we're going to use will all need a discount rate. They'll all need a growth rate. And two of them require dividends. So here's what you need to do. You need to pick a stock. And again, I might pick them for you, and we'll, we'll see. You need to pick a stock that is paying dividends, or if you want to value stock that is not paying dividends, we need to substitute free cash flow per share for that. And I would have to get you that number or help you get that number. Hopefully you've had that in your corporate finance class, uh, but it's a number we can calculate. So if the firm's not paying dividends, we can use free cash flow per share as a substitute. But those are the inputs you're going to need is a discount rate, a growth rate, and a dividend and earnings per share and we'll show you these different models so first the discount rate in paper three you'll have to come up with the discount rate I'm requiring you to use the capital asset pricing model yes there are other models out there no question but you're going to use the capital asset pricing model that uses the risk-free rate plus beta times the market risk premium the risk-free rate there's a few approaches here is you can just use the current 10-year Treasury yield. And in the class notes, I gave you a link to Dr. Dameron and Darren's discussion on that. You might quote him in that. Uh, use the actual 10-year Treasury. Um, I used to say what's called normalize the 10-year Treasury, where I would just take you know some normal real rate, 1% or, 1 or so, plus some expected inflation. Um, and I, I think the normal normalized real, uh, real rate should be about one percent within one percent of real GDP growth. Remember, real GDP G, GDP growth is productivity growth plus labor growth. So I've been showing that number as being around three percent. So that implies the real rate of interest is somewhere around two percent. Well, the real rate of interest is the interest rate without inflation, and I'm saying that should be about two. Where well, right now. The 10-year Treasury is not even 2% by itself. So the real rate of interest right now is actually negative. So I've given up on the normalizing approach because interest rates have been so low for so long. I just don't like that approach anymore. And my preferred approach now is the five-year forward rate. And I've got YouTube videos that show you how to do that. I'd encourage you, some of you, to go and try that. It is... Um, really good skill to know how to do the forward rate, how to get the break-even. 
interest rate and break e the break even uh, inflation rate. So if you're interested in that approach, uh, the, the links are in the class notes, or if you can't find it, email me and I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, so essentially what you're saying there is, hey, we're in a very unusual period of time. Um, the Fed's doing some unusual things, keeping loads, rates on artificially low. Uh, but five years from now, we should be back in more normal period. So what does the bond market say the 10-year Treasury rate will be in five years? And let's use that. That's the forward rate. So we get past all this noise. You can also use that to get the inflation rate. And so you might, you might use that approach. Um, to get the inflation rate, and I'll show you why, on, why you need the inflation rate and then and when we do the market risk premium. The Damodaran article, he says, just use the current 10-year treasury. Now, I think right now that is not a bad approach. And you, what you have to do, though, in your paper, you can't just use the 10-year treasury and not say anything about it. So I would at least load his article and quote him to support why you think using the current 10-year is okay. It's, it's better now than it was last year. Last year when the 10-year got down to like 0.5%, it was a little tough to use such a low risk-free rate. But now that the 10-year is back up to 1.6, 1.7 or so, I don't know what it's gonna be the day that you watch this video, but today it's right around 1.65. Uh, it's getting back to a little bit more normal levels, although if you think about that, that's a nominal rate. That's supposed to cover you for the real rate plus inflation, but by itself it's barely even inflation. So they're, even at a 1.65 10-year treasury, the real rate is still negative. All right, so you need to come up with a risk-free rate somewhere. I'm, I'm actually, when I do the example of papers three and four, I'll, I'll walk through my approach there. All right, now the market risk premium there's two of them. There's a market risk premium and beta. The market risk premium, also known as the equity risk premium, is how much you need over the 10-year treasury to induce you to buy stocks in general. It's a subjective number. It's what you need. It's what you personally need. That's not how we do it in finance. We actually calculate what the average investor needs, and that's what most people do, but ultimately comes down to what you need to induce you to buy stocks. So it can be a personal number. Um, so we're looking for what is that for the average investor? Um, and we're going to use what's called the implied approach. And boy, we've already seen the implied approach. For the implied approach, here's Damodaran's approach. He uses the implied approach. And what he shows is, you know, with the implied approach, what he's showing us is the risk-free rate plus the market risk premium, the two of those together tell you what you expect the stock market to make. And so you can see as the risk-free rate drops, what we expect the stock market to make comes down. Um, but this top line, 8%, he's essentially, man, he's jumped way down here to 5.5%. But the sum of these two, the blue, dark blue and the light blue, is what he thinks the stock market will make that what you think the stock market will earn minus the risk-free rate is the market risk premium. So he's showing that the market risk premium has been fairly stable, but the expected return on stocks has come down as the risk-free rate has come down. So here's his page if you want to get into it and just look, you'll have more discussion on it. Extremely important number, he calls it the equity risk premium. So you know, equity risk premium or market risk premium. So the implied approach, we've already seen this. Remember, the expected return on stocks should equal the required return on stocks. Because if the market expects a 7% return but requires a 9% return, stocks are going to fall until that expected return gets up to 9%. If the market expects a 12% return but requires an 8% return, stocks are going to rally, price is going to come up until that expected return falls to 8%. So markets... Expected returns and required returns should always equal each other. And so the implied report approach says there's no place to go to get a required return on stocks. You can do surveys and all kinds of things, but those are really unreliable. However, we can come up with an expected return on stocks. And the expected return on stocks, as we saw earlier in the class, is the dividend yield plus expected earnings growth. Remember this expected earnings growth? was how much we thought the economy was going to grow. 
productivity plus labor plus inflation. That's the number I keep saying should be between 4 and 6%. This 5.5 I think is on the high end. So I'd probably be more using um, 5% 5, 5 or 4, 4.5%. But you get 7.5% expected return on stocks. If your risk-free rate is 3.5%, which is, would be awfully high, you would get a market risk premium of 4%. So the market risk premium, all you got to do is give me the implied approach, get the current dividend yield, and I'll show you that real quickly. How do you get the current dividend yield? If you type in SPY, SPY is an exchange traded fund on the S&P 500, and you look on the summary page, it will give you a dividend yield. There's the dividend yield, it's one and a half percent. So there's your dividend yield. So you're gonna come up with the expected return on stocks as a dividend yield plus earnings growth. The dividend yield's one and a half percent. We're saying earnings growth is gonna be somewhere in the four to six percent range. So you're gonna get an expected return on stocks somewhere in the five and a half, the seven and a half percent range. And then if your risk-free rate's one, uh, two percent, you'll subtract that and that will give you a market risk premium. Again, I'm going to do this when I do the example. All right, and then beta, we've already covered that. Step one, what kind of company do you have? You need to put this into your paper three. Is it a cyclical or defensive company? What's its operating leverage? What's its financial leverage? What's the history of its beta? So all that goes into your paper three, is including the rolling beta of your company. You've got to do that. I have some students that leave that out. <clears throat> and then what model will you use in paper four? All right, so we've talked about getting your growth rate, getting your, your discount rate. So here's where we just plug it all together. Hopefully you've seen these models before, but if not, what we'll practice, I won't actually do calculations here. I'll do calculations um, when we do the, uh, the walkthrough of paper four, and we'll do a few example problems as well. You'll see there's some good example problems for, for, for exam two practice. But the dividend discount model, also known as the Gordon growth model, is a very straightforward. It's essentially just a, a perpetual growth annuity. So you just take next year's dividend and divide it by your discount rate minus your growth rate. Dividend one, so your discount rate is the risk-free rate plus beta times the market risk premium. The risk-free rate, you'd use the 10-year treasury or maybe the forward curve. The beta, you'll do your revenue sensitivity, operating leverage, financial leverage, and look at the history. Market risk premium, you'll use the implied approach. Your dividend yield plus your expected earnings growth minus whatever your risk-free rate is. So you've got that formula now. The growth, I gave you all those approaches for getting growth. You'll come up with a growth rate. This will probably be your long-term growth rate, so it's going to be somewhere in that 4 to 6% range. If you've got a, a stable firm that's been around forever, like a Campbell's Soup, then your long-term growth will probably be at the lower end of that, maybe 3 to 4% even. If you've got a firm that's growing really fast right now, then you might go up to the higher end of that, 6%. If you don't, have, you don't really have a dividend one, I'm going to show you how to get dividend zero. Dividend zero is the dividend they paid the last 12 months, so you'll need to increase that by 1 plus your growth rate. So... Here's the actual formula you'll use. Dividend zero, which is, I'll, I'll show you how to get it. That's the dividend they paid the last four quarters times one plus your growth rate divided by your discount rate minus your G. I should have made that KE, but KE minus G. One thing really important, I have students that miss this on the, exam, on, the uh, on paper four, and it just amazes me. You know, some students, it's like plug in the calculator and don't even think about it. And you've got to stop and think about what you just did. Does not make any sense? If your growth rate is greater than your discount rate, you will get a negative number. But it's actually not a negative number. If your growth rate is greater than your discount rate, what it means is your valuation is infinity. You're saying your stock is worth infinity. Um, you cannot have a growth rate greater than your discount rate in this model so your growth so if your discount rate is 4.6 percent your growth rate can't be 5.5 percent all right i have students that plug it in get a negative number and they actually report the negative number as their valuation for the company and it seems not to even phase them and it's like wow you know you're you're letting the stress of the semester get to you because 
you just told me that you thought this stock was worth negative seventy-two dollars. Does that make any logical sense? So you know, stop and think about the valuation. You should not get a negative number. If you do, it's probably because your growth rate is too high or your discount rate is too low. So if you have a growth rate that's higher than your discount rate, you will need to make a change. We're assuming that dividends are going to grow at the same growth as earnings. That's probably not a bad assumption for most companies. Um, over the long term, short term, it could be really, really untrue. All right, so there's your first model. It's just plugging numbers in. The second model we'll use is my own creation. So on this one, not only do you, not only do you use this model, but you'll have to give a little explanation on it. Of what, where it came from, who came up with it. But essentially my assumption here is let's assume the firm pays all of its earnings out as, as dividends. So they retain 0%. Now remember with the uh, sustainable growth model you take ROE times retention to get your growth rate. Well if your retention is 0 that implies that your growth is 0. However I'm going to assume if your retention is 0 you can grow with inflation because your earnings include things like depreciation and other non-cash items that you can use to reinvest in the firm and keep your existing capacity. And so you should be able to re re increase your, your revenues by with inflation, your costs will rise with inflation, and so your net income will grow with inflation. Um, so essentially what I'm saying here is, what's the value of this firm? if they just don't grow anymore. It's only the existing firm. That's why I like this model. It's like, what's the value of this existing firm with nothing else added to it? I think for some companies, like a, um, a Campbell Soup or Kellogg's or General Mills, that may be the true value of the firm. What they're currently doing is what they're doing. And so this, I think this can, and, and in fact, for some firms, you'll get a higher valuation using this than you will other models just because they are at such a late stage in their company's development. Um, and so the formula looks exactly like the formula we just did, except instead of using dividend zero, we'll use earnings per share zero, and instead of the growth rate, we use inflation. So it's earnings per share one, earnings per share one is earnings the last four quarters times one plus the inflation rate divided by KE minus inflation. So again, if you, you need inflation in a few places. For that implied growth of the economy, remember it's productivity growth plus labor growth plus inflation, so you use inflation there. Here's another place where you need inflation. So if you come up with that inflation number, you, you just keep freezing it. And so, you know, an inflation number in the one and a half to two percent range would make sense. Three percent is probably too high. I say the Fed targets two and a half percent, but that's not true. The Fed targets more like two percent. If you watch my videos on how to get the implied inflation out of the bond market, you could certainly use that number. It will be probably a little below two percent. So I view this as valuing an existing business without any expansion. So when you use the capitalized earnings model, make sure you explain that this this is a model specific to your professor and you have to explain it a little bit. No one else is going to know what this means. Now, I have some students see capitalized earnings model and they think that's the CAPM, capital asset pricing model, but they're not. The capital asset pricing model gets you the KE. Capitalized earnings model is this formula right here, so don't confuse those two things. So here's the second one you, you use. I'll show you how to use that when I do the video on, on papers three and four. The last one is actually my favorite model. I really like this model. It's called the H model. I discovered it in a footnote in um, one of the study materials we had for the CFA exam when I took it. And I thought, wow, this is great. This is a really, it's a powerful model and a simple model. And it's essentially, it's the dividend discount model, but with an added piece to it. So if you look at the model, the H model, dividend zero times one plus growth divided by KE minus growth, that is the dividend discount model. All we're doing is we're adding this section here in, in between. We're adding this dividend zero times H times short-term growth minus long-term growth. So what is this section here in between? And what that's doing is that's adding the value of that high growth period. So you have a firm that right now is growing really fast. That's its short-term growth. 
We talked about that. That's where you can use the peg ratio approach, the PE ratio divided by peg. What's the, what's the growth over the next five, 10 years? Use that and we're going to add that in. Dividend zero times H times growth short term minus growth long term. The long term growth is going to be that what we've already talked about, that four to six percent US economic growth. Your short term growth is what we just talked about pre previously where we talked about um, look at the historical growth, look at the peg ratio approach, use the sustainable, sustainable growth model. That's that short term growth. So you plug all that in, so you have everything here except for the H. We've got dividend zero times one plus the long-term growth rate, plus dividend zero, we already have that, times H, so we gotta figure that out. Short-term growth, we just got that, minus long-term growth over KE minus long-term growth. So what is the H? The H is what represents the half-life of that shorter-term growth period. So you think of the H as half-life. So if you think a firm's currently growing at 20%, and it's going to take them, and you think their long-term growth is 5%. So right now they're growing 20%, but you think ultimately they'll be a normal company and grow up 5%. And you think that's going to take 10 years. It'll be 10 years from them to go slowly from 20% growth down to 5% growth. If it's 10 years, then your H is one half of that. Your H is five years. So here's an example. You expect growth ne next year of 10%, but ultimate terminal growth of 5.5%. You think it's going to take eight years to get from short-term to long-term growth, then your H is four. And you just plug that in. So think about your paper four. In your paper four, you've got to just, you, you look up the dividend zero. That's pretty easy. You've got to justify your long-term growth. You've got to justify your short-term growth. And you've got to justify your H. It wants you in your inflation and your earnings per share one. So if you think about all the things you need, you have to justify those. The KE you're going to do in paper three, so you already have your KE. But you take each one of those, and so your, your goal in paper four is to justify all of the assumptions you have. So if you go back to these models, dividend discount model, you have dividend zero times one plus growth divided by K minus growth. KE, you already got in paper one. Your dividend zero, you'll use that same number in both your dividend discount model and your H model. Your growth here could be the same as your long-term growth in the H model. Most, people, most students, they use the same number for both. It's possible if you have a fast-growing company, you'll use a higher growth rate here on the dividend discount model than you use for your long-term growth, but it's essentially the same number. So we need dividend zero, we need your KE, we need growth. For the capitalized earnings model, we need earnings per share and inflation. And then for H model, we got to add in the short-term growth and the H. So your paper four is an essentially justifying each one of those assumptions and then just plugging the numbers into a model. And the last thing I'd like you to do, especially on one of the models, maybe the dividend discount model, is to do a, 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 an Excel data table to look at several scenarios. And I'll show you, I'll show you how to do that. Now there are other models. There's one I call the proprietary quantitative model. Um, I do have an example of that uh, that I'll put out on, on black, Blackboard. I can show you that real quickly. But essentially, it's proprietary quantitative model. Proprietary just means I built it. It's not something, I'm not using a dividend discount model. Quantitative just means it's got some numbers in it. And model just means there's a formula somewhere. Um, you know, I built it in Excel. It sounds pretty impressive it's when you're interviewing to say, hey, I built my own proprietary quantitative stock valuation model. The model I have, I think, works really, really well. Uh, it's essentially the H model for companies that don't pay dividends. Um, but let's, let me show it to you and you can just see how I, how I created it. So here's a model. So Google does not pay dividends. Their current earnings per share is $58.61. So you can get that from Yahoo Finance. I'm going to assume that they're, they're growing really, really fast, 25%. This is a fast growing company. They're doing really well. I think ultimately they'll grow about 6%. I think they'll still be above average on the higher end, but at some point they just can't grow 
25% anymore. I think it's going to take them 15 years to go from 25% growth to 6% growth. I'm going to use a 1.5% risk-free rate, 5.5% market risk premium. I'm going to say their beta is 1.4, but uh, you know whatever number you come up with. And I think ultimately they will start paying dividends. And the typical company in the S&P 500 pays out about 40% of their earnings as dividends. So I, I assume they'll just become a, a, a normal company. So you look at this, it looks a lot like the H model, except for I start growing my, my earnings at 25%, 23 and that growth rate just declines over time until ultimately I get down to a 6% growth after 15 years. So there's 15 years right there. So year, year 15, I'm at 6%. And the model assumes as soon as I hit 6% growth, I'll start paying a 40% dividend. And then I'll just take the present value of that. And when I do that, I get a valuation of the stock of 1816.81. Now the current price for the stock is 2129.78. So, you know, I would say, wow, they look... They look a little overvalued to me. They look 17% overvalued using this approach. However, if I were to assume they could keep the growth going for 25 years, then they're undervalued. If it's 20 years, they're undervalued. If it's 18 years, they're exactly right valued. You can see, you know, is it 15 or is it 20? If I assume it takes 15 years, they're overvalued. If I say it takes 20 years, they're undervalued. So you can see how sensitive these things are. Maybe I think they only grow 20%, but for 25 years, there they're overvalued. So it, the, these models are going to be very, very sensitive to your assumptions. But I'm not asking you to use a proprietary quantitative model on your on your paper four, but just to show you that you know it wasn't that hard to build a model like this. And it's essentially the H model for a company that doesn't pay dividends, so I, you know, I kind of like it. It's a good approach. I think it does give me good valuations. A firm like Google is extremely difficult to value because you're, it's so sensitive to that growth rate and the time, how long that high growth rate will last. 25 years is an awful long time. Remember I talked about with Damodarian, we say, you know, 10 is probably all you want to assume. Well, if that's the case, the stock's almost double the value it should be um, and in that case why wow, you got a stock that's really really overvalued so the market's quite optimistic about this firm so it's a quantitative proprietary quantitative model there are other models free cash models uh, most professors especially in academia they propose they propose free cash flow models as the best model uh, we're not going to use that in this class just because we're not really covering free cash flow in this class um, I do cover this more in my security analysis class, but free cash flow is, it, you know, it depends on how you calculate it. There's several different calculations. A lot of people, free cash flow is just cash from operations minus capital expenditures. Uh, if you go to the Bloomberg machines, they'll give you a free cash flow for your company, but it's their definition. So free cash flow is not a number you can go look up on a financial statement. It's a calculation, and there's some disagreement exactly how to calculate it, but essentially what we mean by free cash flow is that's the cash the firm is producing that they could pay in dividends if they wanted to. And they may not pay dividends. They might actually buy stock back. They might pay down debt. They might expand the capacity of their firm. They might acquire another firm. They may hold it for future opportunities. But it's any cash that they have that they could pay in dividends. Now, if they need that cash just to reinvest in the firm, just to keep them where they are, to keep maintain their current capacity, that would not be a free cash flow. That's cash flow they have to reinvest. You know, the money Walmart has to spend to fix their stores, paint their stores, uh, whatever refurbishing they need, it doesn't increase their capacity any. It just keeps them where they are. That would not be part of free cash flow. So that part of capital expenditures would, would definitely want to subtract out. But if they have a choice between paying dividends or expanding overseas and they decide to span over, expand overseas, that's a free cash flow because I had a choice of what to do with that cash flow. So that's that's the number you're looking for. What cash is the firm producing that they have a lot of flexibility? They could pay dividends, buy back stock, pay down debt, expand capacity. You want to take that number and use it to value the firm 
instead of dividends. You can take that free cash free cash flow from for the firm on a firm wide basis so that means before interest expense in that case you value the firm using the cost of capital minus the growth rate and then you subtract out the value of the debt or you can do the free cash flow to the equity to the stockholders so do you do, then you do free cash flow minus interest expense so if you use cash from operations cash from operations already has interest expense subtracted out so if you use that as your approach, you essentially have free cash flow to the equity holders. Then essentially you can just use free cash flow per share and use it just like we use dividends in the dividend discount model and the H model and just use free cash flow per share instead of dividends and you can value the, the firm that way. So that is one approach. Most professors say that's the best approach. Most of my students that use this approach, it gives them the wackiest answer. So there's 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 some issue with exactly which number to use for the free cash flow and and you you'll probably get the craziest number contingent claims models is really beyond the, the the scope of this class but essentially what it says is and we'll talk about options later in the class it says value the firm using dividend discount model but the firm also has these options of things they could do they could drill for oil they could develop a new a new drug. They could they could do a new movie that becomes the next blockbuster Toy Story or Story or Star Star Wars. They have these options of things they could do. If they start to drill for more oil, if they find oil, then they're going to be really really rich. If they drill and there's nothing there, they can shut it down and they haven't lost anything. That type of optionality doesn't work well in a dividend discount model. You really need to use what's called an option pricing model. So essentially the value of the firm is the value of the firm using dividend discount model plus the value of that option using some option pricing model. Well beyond the, 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 the confines of our class. But if you're interested in that, I've, I've got a, um, my notes from Dr. Damaderens. He does a graduate class where he talks about this. If you went and watched his class, he actually has a model that he shares where you can actually do the contingent claims yourself. If you're really serious about finance and you really want to get on the investment side, I'd encourage you to watch his class, get his model, and try it so you can at least talk about it in an interview and it'd be really impressive. There are other models I absolutely do not like. We were taught these models when I was in school. The multi-stage models, these formulas are crazy. I had a professor actually require us to memorize this formula for an exam. I was the only one that did because I could somewhat tell he was going to do that and boy the whole class failed miserably except for me I I did well because I knew to memorize this formula and boy those students were upset with him because he didn't tell us he was going to put this formula on the exam without us and that we'd have to have it from memory and boy people were upset but with Excel you can essentially do all of this in Excel and you don't need to memorize this massive formula essentially all this formula is doing is exactly what the H model does exactly what my proprietary quantitative model does it's just it's much easier to do it in excel than try you know you see all these sum functions well excel does these sum functions a whole lot better than uh, a financial calculator will so, so i would recommend never memorizing these formulas there's just no need to have something that lengthy and um, complex all right so where do we go from here our next video i'm going to actually walk you all the way through papers three and four use an example company I'll use either use Walmart or Campbell soup I'm not sure which we'll see whichever company I picked you can't use that company for your company I'll walk all the way through it so when you get to the next video what you want to do is have your company picked and maybe be hitting pause as I go so you can build your company while I'm doing the example company